you look at the uh, post-birth development, there's quite a lot uh, going on and, and there are some uh, big surprises also to, to a large extent. Um, so this is the number of synapses in uh, just the cortex uh, where you can see what happens here prior to birth and this is about birth here. This is about five years old and this is going into about uh, 15 uh, 16 years of age. So what you basically see is that uh, there's no real thing uh, as an important communication here. There's no real sign here that what happens at birth, it's not like things all of a sudden stop or accelerate or anything. It's, it's just going like that, relatively linear. So certainly you give, you're born at some point but from the point of view of your brain, uh, this is an unimportant event, apparently. Uh, so it's just continuing the same line of uh, uh, development here. So this also means that around the age of five, six years, uh, you have the most connections in your brain that you will ever have. Uh, and then what happens a little bit later on, especially during your... Uh, early teens is that you start losing all of those connections. What happens later on is actually that you stay at more or less the same level uh, the rest of your life. Uh, so what this shows and, and which has been described in many 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 animals uh, uh, going back uh, several decades is basically that we're born with, well we're not born, that was the wrong word again, when we're five years old, we have much more connections in our brain that we will actually need. So what is going to happen later on is that we get rid of some of those connections that we don't need. So again, this is now environment which influences your development. So you have genetically determined that just make a lot of connections and then let's see which of these will actually work. So you start getting experience, you start doing things, you start interacting with your environment, you learn some languages, you learn some motor skills, you do various things and slowly you impose specific uh, constraints on, on the network because you train some networks, other networks are not being trained so they start uh, disappearing, so you stretch in those networks that you really need in order to do the things that you do. Uh, and therefore, by the end of maybe your teens, you end up being more or less the person you are uh, with relatively little capacity for major changes. That is not to say that there's no possibility for any changes at all. We can all still change, even though we're getting older and older and older, so even when we are 80, 90, we can still change, but not to the same extent as when we are five years old, basically. So we have lots of opportunities open when we are five, six years old, and they gradually become less and less through the experience that we get throughout our early teens. That's what it is basically all about. Um, well, this is just to show the, more or less the exactly same thing uh, in a slightly different way. This is um, uh, a study which was made at uh, Vidor Hospital, imaging study some years ago, again showing this decrease in uh, the size of the, the cerebral cortex, but also showing that there's essentially no change later on, even up to uh, the age of uh, 100. So the real changes are taking place here in... Uh, before you're basically 25, 30 years old, a decrease in the number of connections, a decrease in the size of the brain. This is another example of the same thing. Mutilization of the corticospinal tract continues even up to the age of 20. Uh, so there is a continuous uh, development of the connections. Um, so many of the things related to how the neuron actually differentiate, 
grow, find the place that they should be situated in the cortex or in, in the rest of the brain, and how they find their different connections are also, again, a mix of genetic uh, programming. Uh, so at one point in development, the neurons will start to uh, grow, they will differentiate, and they will move to specific uh, places in the nervous system. Again, this is then determined also by signals in the environment. If there are specific proteins being uh, produced by the, uh, especially the glia cells, which are in the surrounding environment, uh, then that will be used as uh, guides for the growth and for, for the uh, migration of the different neurons. This also goes for uh, the axons, when uh, an axon has to find a specific target and make contact with that target. I think from my point of view, the most impressive is uh, that of the corticospinal tract. This is the longest tract that we have in the nervous system, therefore also the longest axons, the axons which have to find their way through the longest distance uh, in the nervous system. And it's kind of uh, fascinating to see how uh, these accents uh, managed to uh, find their way. And there's quite a lot of this uh, uh, which is now known. Uh, so basically we know that these accents start to grow uh, basically uh, from uh, a genetic programming, but in order to find their way there are different signals which tell them which way to go. Uh, so basically when they start growing somewhere up here in the uh, cortex they have a growth cone which uh, starts moving over the glia cells in the surrounding. So it's again basic uh, in many ways same uh, way of doing things as you would in a muscle or that you would in a very primitive animal which uh, only has a little bit of calcium and a little bit of actin, uh, which is enough in order to have a contraction cycle going on in this growth cone so that it can slowly move over the uh, uh, surface. But again, there has to be some signal which tells it which way to go and which way not to go. So there are simple flag posts in different parts of the environment telling the accent either that please come this way or telling the accent don't go this way, this is a forbidden area. Uh, so it turns out that uh, these accents to begin with, they will just start growing in any direction, uh, relatively unhindered. What happens first is that they encounter some of these protein called FETCF2 and CTIP1, which are located and being produced by glia cells uh, in uh, the immediate surrounding environment, which will basically tell the uh, neurons or the axons not to grow in sort of the horizontal layer, but force them to grow downwards. So they sort of meet a barrier, and it's sort of almost like a tunnel that they can uh, grow through. So they're, they're being hindered in growing in the horizontal plane and therefore forced more or less down a tube uh, along the, you have to imagine the uh, length of the neural tube uh, early on. So they will grow down into uh, the uh, spinal cord essentially. At some point they need to cross over and uh, this is where some of the fun begins uh, because then the question comes that uh, Stefan was, was also po uh, uh, posing just before we started, why the hell do they have to cross over? Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, because there are these proteins which tell them to uh, cross over. So there is actually a genetic program uh, in the glia cells which will make sure that at this point of development they will produce these proteins which will tell those bloody uh, axons to cross the uh, midline and descend on, in the other uh, side of the spinal cord. Uh, so again, uh, signaling in uh, the environment. Uh, finally, uh, when you reach the uh, 
uh, spinal cord, you reach the target, you have to stop these axons from growing because you, you could imagine that you have some motor neurons there and uh, you have the axon coming there. If the axon just continues growing without realizing that this is the motor neuron that you should connect to, you're going to have a problem. So you have to tell them that please stop growing now and start making connections. So there are signals which basically tell axons to stop the growth program so the growth cone will disappear and instead they will start sprouting and try to communicate with whatever is there in the surroundings. And these are some of the neurons or some of the proteins which are known to signal all of this. Uh, so whenever you put one of these proteins onto a nerve cell, it will start sprouting and it will start trying to make connections with other uh, uh, neurons. Now I think th this is all fascinating and, and it sort of tells us something about the development of the nervous system. What is really important in this is that this is new knowledge. This is knowledge that we have gained within the past five, six years, more or less. It means that now we can actually manipulate what a ner nerve cell is doing. We can basically tell a nerve cell to start growing. We can tell a nerve cell to not grow in that direction. We can tell it to grow in that direction. We can tell it to stop growing and make connections. This means that we can start really repairing the nervous system because we can orchestrate how injured nerve cells, how the injured nervous system can be repaired by giving some of these uh, proteins at the right point in the right way in order to uh, get these neurons to grow out and make new connections. So by knowing all of this information we can actually apply it uh, in a